uh, before I start, I would just like to thank Dr. Huan Zhou for spending all the time and effort to organize this. So my name is Zhong Ji. Currently, I'm a postdoc in the MA department. And today, my topic will be on the introduction to metal additive manufacturing. Uh, in terms of the reference texts, uh, I will recommend uh, two uh, references, actually. The first one is actually on welding, because uh, due to the rapid solidification nature, similarity between welding and additive, uh, there are a lot of rich uh, metallurgy knowledge uh, based on this book. And also, uh, recently, there's a quite a nice review written by Prof. De Broy on this topic. And uh, in case you want to read further, uh, these two are very uh, good sources, especially on the metallurgical part. And in terms of the cost outline, the cost uh, for today is mainly designed for the undergraduate or master's students who have little knowledge about additive. I will give a very brief uh, history on the development of the technique. Also talk about different classifications or genres of this um, uh, AM process. Then I will mention uh, accordingly the common materials being used, the typical microstructure formed, as well as briefly speak about the uh, general mechanical behaviors of this technique. So I like a lot of the uh, talks we have been having so far, which a lot of them focusing on characterization uh, techniques. So as all of you, all of us know that a metal AM is a material forming process. And if you look at the recent development history of our human history, we can see that all the major milestones of our development are all marked by different stages of industrial revolutions. So by the end of 18th century, that's the first time where we got a new source of power by steam engine. Then um, when electricity came around in the second in, uh, industrial revolution, that's where mass production is truly enabled. And that's also the period of time where as a human uh, population on the, on, on the globe uh, show a very rapid increase, and also our living standard uh, increases drastically simply because we are able to produce more goods. Uh, for, for our daily needs. Then uh, when internet came around, it also brings a lot of electronics, sensors, which add another dimension of complexity of the machines that we are having. In other words, we are able to produce some goods which we were not able to produce before. And uh, for many people, they believe that uh, for the uh, fourth industrial revolution is based on cyber physical production. What that means is that they want to further uh, reduce the amount of interaction between human and uh, machines. So uh, uh, for very interesting uh, phenomenon is that during this recent pandemic, uh, the additive manufacturing uh, sector is one of the sectors which was not so badly affected by this uh, uh, various stages of lockdown because it enables people who to work remotely on these uh, machines and to produce all, all sorts of complex complex parts. So that's why a lot of people people believe that AM is on the forefront to lead this fourth industrial revolution. And uh, this is a very nice picture showing the uh, somewhat uh, a historical development of AM. So at the very beginning, it, uh, the first uh, part built by uh, AM is actually polymers using steel lithography. Then uh, gradually, all the big players for the uh, metal AM came in, uh, such as Optomac, uh, uh, Concept Laser, as well as Trum. So actually, quite a lot of them are based or originated in Germany. So that's a very unique advantage of Germany to work or research in metal AM. Then uh, when people really getting serious about this topic uh, is when those uh, major industrial uh, players came in, such as in 2012, uh, G Aviation, probably one of the first uh, global uh, companies to adopt AM, purchase one of the uh, AM uh, companies. Then in 2016, in my personal opinion, this is a very historical year for Metal AM because it's during this year that the GE group as a whole purchased two of the biggest um, uh, Metal AM uh, machine producers, Concept Laser as well as Arkham. Also Siemens invested a ton of money in AM facility. They have this huge factory which composes, comprises nothing but AM machines just to fabricate all the parts they need. And then HP, which is the original printing company, also entered the business uh, by producing some sintering machines. And also desktop metal, which are developed uh, by a few professors from MIT, also came into picture. So it is around this time that we can see a very 
uh, rapid increase of these um, uh, monetary uh, issues surrounding AM. So to put this uh, into perspective of numbers and figures, so this graph simply illustrates the amount of uh, money being involved uh, around AM. So at the very early stage, uh, I'm not sure if this is even called uh, additive manufacturing back then, probably it's even called rapid prototyping or even laser colliding. So people from the US have already been starting to experimental, uh, experimental with this type of technique. And this is built in titanium. And in my opinion, this is how does uh, metal M looks like uh, back in the days when it's still in the infancy stage. And then uh, one of the first companies to adopt AM for their daily production is probably the Airbus. And now what they are using AM is for nothing but for weight reduction and topological optimization. So they want to reduce the amount of weight for their um, component, but uh, to keep the same structural rigidity. And that's a very nice example of AM parts. And then uh, in 2016, as we all know from our last slide, which is very important for this community, and this uh, very special example came around. So it's called the uh, GE uh, engine uh, fuel nozzle. So it's the part which uh, uh, transports the fuel into the combustion chamber. So what's special about uh, this part is that um, uh, historically it is being produced by 20 different parts welded well together. So you can imagine the amount of work that needs to be done to produce this part alone. And now with the arrival of AM, you can produce this in one shot and to accompany with that, you have a quarter of weight reduction and it's almost five times more durable. So even at this stage, um, the GE company just to produce this part alone, they are making a profit out of this. So, and this is uh, tremendously important for these industry players to bring, to see this revenue based on their investment. And gradually in 2019, uh, something which caught my eye very surprisingly is that uh, this particular company based in the US, they use uh, additive to produce a fuel tank for a space rocket. And uh, this is uh, built in aluminum alloys, if I'm not mistaken. And just two weeks ago, when I check again on their website, they have already produced a full range rocket. And if you check on YouTube, you can see the process where every component just linked together by this one machine. So that's kind of fascinating to me. And uh, uh, just uh, earlier this year uh, in Amsterdam, uh, uh, they have this, uh, entire stainless steel bridge built by additive. Uh, so they have, I think, six or four robotic arms to build this from scratch. And uh, if you look at the uh, entire trajectory of the AM development, they have really gone through a long way to come into different uh, industrial sectors as well as our daily uh, lives. So uh, additive is not only about research, it's really having a direct impact on our society. And that's also why it is so exciting for a lot of people to get involved in this business. And uh, in terms of the different categories, I took this graph simply from the ASTMM standard. I'm not going through everything because based on different categories, you can, uh, can saw different names came around. I just want to highlight two names that are commonly uh, used in the AM uh, field. One of, one of them is the directed energy deposition. Another one of them is the powder bed fusion, which I will uh, illustrate a little bit in the uh, next slide. So for the powder bed fusion technique is also um, uh, divided into two groups. One of them is called the laser powder bed fusion or selective laser melting. It means nothing but the energy source is laser. So, if we look at the schematics, we can see that uh, there are two uh, chambers involved, one of them containing all the raw powder material, the other one is where the fabrication actually took place. So whenever, for each layer, this powder uh, delivery piston will move up, then this roller will bring a certain amount of powder over to the fabrication piston, then that's where laser starts to work, and uh, it will uh, simply move according to the computer designed cap data. And this is uh, uh, a video that I took of the printer uh, in-house downstairs. So it's very similar. You move that position, the thin layer of powder, this laser starts to work. There's always the argon flow from the right to the left uh, to take away all the oxidized and burn out powders. So um, 
personally, in my opinion, this is a rather mature technique in the way that this has been very much implemented almost in all the um, research institutes, as well as a lot of the companies, uh, at least in Germany, I have seen a lot for this technique. And another technique uh, which uh, also mentioned, get, getting mentioned a lot is the electron uh, powder bed fusion, or simply referred as to electron beam melting. If you look at schematics, it's very, very similar. Rather, instead of the laser, it's using electron beam. And uh, typically, the chamber build size tends to be a little bit larger compared to the laser system. I will show um, a comparison of all these techniques in the next slide. Uh, yeah. And uh, lastly, for the uh, directed energy deposition, so the major difference for DED process compared to the previous two is that it does not need to lay down any uh, a layer of powder on the fabrication plate before start to uh, machine. So as you can see, that powder came out at the same time with the laser. So it has the unique advantage of saving a lot of powders in this way. Uh, then if we put all of these uh, three common techniques in one slide to see what's the advantage or disadvantages among each of them, I think the easiest way to remember this is simply remember the application which all of these techniques were designed for. And for instance, for the laser powder bed fusion technique, uh, this is a cylinder head which, which is actually designed for a racing car. And in order to design this part, the main requirement is that it has to have a very complex structure so that uh, it can take the uh, structural load. But at the same time, that uh, they also have a lot of channels to facilitate heat dissip dissipation or heat conduction. And to realize these two functionalities, uh, it has to have a very nice resolution. That's the pre-requirement. And for the laser powder bed fusion technique, among all the techniques, it has the smallest uh, laser focused spot, spot size, as well as it also uses the uh, smaller range of powder size compared to the other two. So uh, naturally, it has the best resolution. And also, with the laser as being the energy source, it has a very wide range of materials that it can work with. Then for the electron beam uh, melting or electron powder bed fusion technique, most of its products actually went into uh, the medical sector, such as the skull implant or hip implant, for a very simple reason. I think almost all of us here have worked with SEM before. So in order for this electron beam to work, uh, the entire chamber had to be vacuumed. And that's the same here. And simply because it's a vacuum environment, there's very little room for the impurity to come into place. So in terms of uh, part impurity uh, tolerances, this process is actually the best. Of course, compared to the laser system, the surface is tend to be a little bit rougher, but the good thing about implants is that all these rough surfaces is actually very desirable for cell in growth and cell uh, development. So actually that came into a strength for this technique when it came into the medical scene. And also uh, compared to laser, if you know how this laser works, you know that uh, the, the entire laser beam is actually guided by two mechanical mirrors. So the speed of laser movement is limited by this mechanical movement of, of mirror. But for the electron beam, everything is controlled electronically. So the speed uh, is a lot faster and that's also result in a faster build rate compared to the uh, laser system. Lastly, for the uh, DED process, as we have seen already previously in the um, space uh, fuel tank rocket. So since it does not need to lay any powders before printing, so there's actually really a no size limitation in terms of how big it can print. So every time it can build a sample as, as much as your robotic arm can move up. And also typically for this DED process, because it does not hold any uh, powder on the powder bed, the, the, this uh, workplace is typically, typically on a five axis rotation. So it can build a lot of complicated shapes without any support structures to ensure a good heat conduction. So these are very uh, desirable for this technique. And also because it uses the same energy source. So it also has a very wide uh, material range uh, to begin with. And then for the common materials that are currently being uh, employed in the metal AM field, 
uh, my personal opinion, the number one has to go to titanium for two for two simple reasons. First of all, titanium is relatively more expensive compared to other type of alloys. And second of all, titanium is very difficult to machine because it has a very high hardness as well as wear resistance, etc. And uh, simply because AM uh, is using powders, so it can always recycle the unused powders or even used powders. So the amount of material waste is actually very uh, limited. That's all uh, beneficial for such expensive material. And also AM is able to produce near net shape parts. So the subsequent machining is also not needed as much as the conventional um, manufacturing methods. So both of them are very desirable for titanium alloys. The second group of alloy is steel, which all of us are very familiar with. Uh, they are used extensively for structural, um, uh, from structural reasons. And also, when we move to high temperature applications, there are also a lot of nickel uh, in canals to play around. Of course, we have other type of materials, such as cobalt uh, chromium, mainly used for dental implants, as well as aluminum for lightweight structures. But uh, all, all in all, in my personal opinion, there's still a huge gap in terms of the amount of different types of materials that can be designed and used by the AM community. And uh, that's actually, in my opinion, a very interesting genre for all the uh, metallurgists. Mm, before I show you any typical microstructure, I just want to uh, briefly explain why the microstructure of AM build sample is so much different compared to the conventional casting or forging counterparts. So if let's uh, imagine each of these is a single male pool uh, built by the laser. And uh, within this male pool is still in the liquid uh, state as the laser is still shining. So if we zoom in in the, this male pool, we can uh, imagine that uh, every male pool experience a unique uh, solidification process. So in other words, each of them is a single casting experiment. And uh, if we move down from this male pool for the male pool below it, probably it uh, didn't experience a complete remelting, but uh, it certainly experienced a reheating process. And uh, so this is almost very similar to a short period of heat treatment experiment that we tend to do. And also if we move down even further as the material starts to cool down, accompanied with this cool down is a thermal shrinkage, which brings a lot of residual stresses. And sometimes these residual stresses are so high that they introduce a ton of these locations. And into the, if we put this into the conventional metallurgical terms, this is very similar to a hot rolling process. And a lot of the times, not every time, we will be uh, seeing different types of cracks, uh, either hot cracking or cold cracking. And this is almost like a factual damage analysis. So in my personal, personal opinion, this also makes AM very interesting in a way that it embodies uh, different aspects of the conventional metallurgy. And that's also the reason why a lot of the conventional metallurgists can move into AM so rapidly because there has to be one way or another they can link their previous work into this new technique. And uh, for the typical microstructure, this is probably the first uh, image I took when I started my PhD back in 2015 or so. So this is the stainless steel 316L etched surface along the build direction. And we, are, we can still see some porosities or what we call lack of fusion uh, pores between different uh, uh, building layers. On the first glance, this is very messy and very difficult to understand what's really happening. But actually, it's not very difficult once you understand how, how this laser is actually moving around. So for instance, if we take a closer look of this area, you can see that during the fabrication, the laser always moves back and forth from the right to the left. So when this first laser came in, there's a male pool being formed. And when this laser, uh, second laser came in, it eats away part of the male pool. And that's why all these male pool boundaries are so closely spaced out uh, with respect to one another. And uh, in, in AM production, typically for each layer, they have a 67 degree of rotation to minimize the amount of residual stress that's being accumulated in the escute part. So if we do a simple rotation here, we can see that uh, although the laser still uh, move in this back and forth manner, the average distance between each uh, laser uh, track 
on this particular uh, viewing plane are kind of spaced out. And that's why in this particular case, the male pool boundaries are slightly further away from each other. And if we continue to add another rotation, uh, there will be a situation where all the laser lines are somewhat parallel to our viewing plane. And that's also the reason why we are seeing these lines on top of each other, almost you know, uh, stack on top of one another. And if you know this, uh, how this laser moves, then you can fully understand why is this kind of uh, tracks forming. And uh, that's also going to be very beneficial in the future if you see any type of uh, AM build samples. Uh, in terms of the green morphologies, there is a huge difference between the AM build path as well as the conventional forging or casting path. So once again, this is a stainless steel 316L uh, sample. So if we see these uh, male pools, we can see that uh, all these green morphologies are somewhat uh, very, very messy. If we, uh, so when I first uh, look at uh, AM build sample, it's very confusing to understand the effect. And within each of these male pool, you always see gradients within each male pool, which you rarely see among the conventional uh, samples. For instance, for the forging sample, we are starting to see a stack, uh, twin, twin boundaries as this is a, it has a very low stacking fault energy. And for casting sample, actually, you can still see the high temperature uh, delta ferrite, uh, but uh, they, all of these uh, BCC phases have been kinetically surprised uh, during the uh, rapid solidification of the AM processes. And if we just zoom in on one of the uh, male pools, we can see that uh, there's a clear uh, evidence that epitextual growth happen uh, across this male pool boundary. And uh, this is also a very um, crowded and, and messy type of microstructure. But what I want to point out is that even within the same green, we're always having this kind of uh, uh, gradient or slight green rotation happening within each green. And it's commonly believed that due to the uh, residual stresses uh, occurred during the uh, fabrication, and but this is a typically a unique uh, feature pertaining to AM. And another unique feature on the microstructure is really this, uh, what we call cellular structures, or you can also call it cellular dendrites. So for this, if the dendrites are growing parallel to our viewing plane, then we are seeing it, it as the elongated rods, but if it's coming out of the plane, they are, then we are seeing it as uh, very spherical spheres. So why there are so many people interested in this um, uh, unique microstructure <laughs> in a large region, in a large uh, reason uh, got to do with this particular paper. So they realized that for this uh, stainless steel 316 uh, once you do the tensile test, it's both uh, stronger and more ductile compared to the past manufactured, let's say, casting or forging. And the reason is that uh, they believe uh, uh, this EB, uh, this TM graphs are at about 3% of uh, tensile elongation. We are already starting to see this uh, slip bands, but this uh, cellular structure is still very rigid in a way they are not being eaten away. And if you will do an uh, EBSD on this region, uh, you can see that uh, the misorientation between each cell is very minimal. So people think uh, this particular cell cellular structure is very much different from the conventional um, dislocation cells, which is mainly used to accommodate um, misorientations. And then if you continue to pull this sample from you know, 3%, to about 10% and 20%, you realize that this cellular structure will give away their uh, uh, structures once all the twinnings came in. So in this particular paper, they believe that uh, it is this unique uh, cellular dislocation structures which contribute to the concurrent increment of strength and ductility. Uh, because this is a very unique feature uh, pertaining only to AM, I'd like to give another two slides to explain a little bit further about uh, this topic. So since this thing is really interesting, people uh, begin to try to investigate um, uh, why is this thing being formed in the first place. So on the left, this is a work from the same group as the previous slide. So and under the very um, high resolution TM, they can see a lot of um, nano uh, precipitations or oxides have been formed uh, uh, only within the dislocation cells. And if they do a um, uh, very 
um, stepwise heat treatment, they can see the evolution of the composition of these precipitations. But the overall idea is that these precipitations are very, uh, uh, can stand very much a lot of heat without giving away their uh, structure. So they believe that it is these precipitations which are uh, essential to lock this dislocation, dislocation cell structure and give their morphologies. And then um, uh, soon after that, probably one or two months later, when this paper out, uh, there's another group from the Australia. They study a different type of material, but uh, they didn't uh, investigate uh, just within the bulk. They investigate at a very top surface where this particular uh, layer has not been exposed to any remelting or reheating. And if we take a very close look of this particular location, they found that uh, there are actually quite a number of uh, nanocrystalline greens, greens happening. Uh, it's, it's very um, uh, evident, in my opinion. Then once they move down to the middle of this uh, box sample, they are starting to see the typical cellular structures. So in their opinion, they believe that uh, these cellular structures is nothing but an evolution of a uh, growth mechanism of these nanocrystalline greens. Which, which is also very interesting. And then uh, another group from the US, uh, they did a very interesting experiment in a way that they didn't only build a 3D um, sample like the previous two, rather they did both 1D and 2D. 2D is very simple to understand. It means nothing but a plain wall by a single laser movement. But 1D is simply just a one dot of laser for each of the uh, deposition. And the reason why they conduct such experiment is that they believe about the 1D sample, because as the material starts to be built up, there's no surrounding materials. In other words, this part does not experience any type of residual stresses due to the adjacent material shrink or cooling. And then they've done also a ton of very nice TM work mainly taking along the uh, green boundaries or cellular dendrites. So if we take a closer look of the 1D structure where they believe the residual stress content is very low, surprisingly, they didn't see these um, uh, uh, cellular structures at all, or they, they are not even seeing a lot of dislocations at all. And then when they move on to the 2D structure, these locations start to form, but they didn't form in this uh, particular cellular structure. And uh, very interestingly, as they uh, work for the 3D uh, sample, they didn't cut entirely from the deposited material, rather they cut at the uh, interface between the newly built material as well as the built plate. So the difference between these two regions is that uh, the top part experienced solidification, while the second part only experienced thermal shrinkage. And then to their surprise is that both of the uh, areas uh, shows the same type of cellular structures. So that's why from this particular work, they concluded that uh, the origin of these uh, cellular structures is mainly due to the dislocation densities. And once these dislocation densities reach a threshold, they automatically align themselves uh, uh, for, to form this type of uh, uh, cellular dislocations. Personally, I think all of these uh, explanations are really interesting, uh, but obviously do, they do not agree with each other at this point of time. And then uh, uh, I just want to show one slide in terms of the um, huge uh, room for microstructure engineering or microstructure manipulation for the AM processes. It is because as we are always using laser or electron beam there are always a range of a lot of parameters that you can manipulate on how this energy source is moving around. So one of the first work in this area is done by the Oak Ridge people, Oak Ridge National Lab in the US. So uh, in their electron beam melting machine, they built these <laughs> specific letters using uh, conventional inconel material. And soon after that, uh, they, they have uh, some very nice simulation guys who are able to simulate the thermal gradient as well as the solid liquid interface velocity during the solidification. And then they can back check to put them into this uh, column to equix the transition maps. And by knowing all these parameters, they are successful to design different types of green morphologies 
in their uh, EBM built in canal samples. Obviously, uh, subsequently, they also published another paper where you have a, a layer of a columnar greens followed by a layer of EQS greens. Then, uh, then it's getting really complicated and interested, interesting. For the stainless steel samples, uh, there's also a group in Osaka, Japan. Uh, they also kind of interesting microstructure this uh, layer wise. So uh, to keep it very short, in the middle of the male pool, we have a 001 uh, conventional uh, texture, but in between the center of the male pools, we are seeing 011 texture. And in this particular work, they claim that uh, this sample has a superior uh, corrosion resistance compared to the common samples with a uh, common uh, texture. And also last time we were also able to uh, build sample by manipulate the uh, laser uh, traveling paths, et cetera, to change the conventional 001 texture to 011 texture, which subsequently affected their tensor properties quite a lot. So I just want to uh, put this here to show that uh, there's really, really a huge uh, room to play for this uh, microstructure engineering within the AM field. And just by targeting this microstructure to the desired uh, properties being into mechanical or functional, I think there can be a lot of interesting work uh, done. And uh, last, I just want to so show the remaining three slides on the general mechanical behaviors. So from this very nice review on the electron beam melting built uh, TS64 samples by Prof. Lawinski, we can see that uh, on the top, on the right, uh, uh, right three samples are the conventional casting and forge or rock samples, and everything on the left are kind of built by additive. Of course, some of them have an additional step of uh, heat treatment of keeping. So if we just look at very generally, we can find that for the AM built samples, most of them have a higher U strength or UTS uh, compared to the uh, conventional methods. It's simply because as I have explained before, during the uh, solidification or, or cooling stage, uh, you went through the residual stress stresses impose a step which is very similar to hot rolling. So the dislocation content is somewhat higher. And then there's really no surprise that for the AM built samples, it has a slightly lower ductility compared to the common uh, conventional methods. And uh, in terms of the uh, fatigue behaviors, this is certainly one area which all of the AM uh, researchers are not uh, certainly proud of. It is because uh, if you work in the fatigue uh, uh, community, you know that uh, defects are essential for fatigue uh, performance. And for AM built paths, uh, it first of all have a lot of surface roughnesses, uh, what we call surface defects. And second of all, if your laser or electron beam parameters were, were not optimized uh, very nicely, then there can be a, a lot of internal pulse, which can also serve as a crack uh, nucleation site. So on the figure, for the figure on the left, if we have, if we take a part directly out of the uh, 3D printer and do the conventional fatigue test, we can see that it lags far behind from the conventional counterparts. And if we just remove the outer surface, uh, machine to, to uh, very uh, uh, low, to machine to the outer surface, take away the surface defects, then it's the fatigue property increases slightly. And then uh, if we take a, a part uh, from the machine out without re removing the surface defects, just to a, a very quick and fast heaping process, it actually didn't improve drastically on the fatigue performance. The only time that you are starting to have somewhat comparable fatigue properties is that you took, take away both the surface roughnesses as well as the uh, internal porosities or defects then that's when you are, have somewhat uh, the same uh, fatigue properties as the conventional parts. Then for the last slide is on the creep. I have to um, give a word of caution. This creep party is currently still under a lot of debate, even within the AM community, community alone, simply because uh, due to the complexity of the experiment, there are not a lot of existing literature reporting on this uh, creep. Uh, uh, behavior. So some people for the figure on the left, left two figures, uh, some people report that for compression or tensile creep, actually the uh, SM built after heat treatment are somewhat better compared to the rot materials. 
But then at the same time, you are also having people reporting that uh, if you take a SML EBM build without any um, further annealing or heat treatment, it's actually a lot worse in terms of the fatigue performance. So there's honestly still a lot of work to be done, especially in this uh, creep area uh, for the AM materials. I believe, yeah, that's the end of my talk. Thank you so much. If there's any question, I'm happy to take the question. Yeah, thank you.